You're not? Okay. Hi again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, a journalist, as a journalist, I mean, I'm more of a writer than a speaker. Um, it's been like eight odd years that I've been working as a professional journalist, full-time journalist. Uh, originally, I've been working as a psychological linguist and working with people suffering from trauma in conflict zones in different countries. And since part of my family belongs to Pakistan, I went back there and started working as a journalist. Um, a conflict has many aspects associated to it. And it's a pretty layered thing, uh, which is difficult to decipher, particularly when there's so much going on and so much of violence. Uh, some of the best things that have been written or spoken about in conflict are usually when the conflict is over. Unfortunately, in our case, it's not been over so far. Uh, we can only choose a side of a conflict to explain and to understand uh, the technological dependency of the area and the way that surveillance tactics are taking place in this particular zone. I've managed to put in some points, not as detailed as the previous speaker, but I managed to put in something just to give you an idea of actually how things are in the tribal areas. And of course, I mean, all of you have come to know the tribal areas as associated with something that is known as global jihadism and terrorism in general. Uh, it's spoken about, but very few understand the dynamics of actually how everything had taken place away and how it's become a totally mutated area with so many different groups operating from this international and local, uh, causing a threat to everyone. Um, yeah. So this is, I mean, you see the map of Pakistan and the tribal areas, which has the federally administered tribal areas, are right on the border with Afghanistan. And it's, a, it's not that uh, huge an area. It's like approximately some way uh, 2,600 square kilometers. And it's segregated into seven parts generally. But the problem with this area is that it's like sharing almost 3,000 kilometers uh, of a border with Afghanistan. And that's always been an area of conflict um, since almost like three decades of war. And as you go ahead, I will explain to you actually what's happening around over here. The Britishers, when they entered into the subcontinent, as we've come to know as India and Pakistan now, what they basically tried to do was to establish a legal system through which um, I mean, justice could be served in some way or the other. But in this particular terrain, they actually pay, faced a lot of problems. And since uh, colonial occupiers, as I would suggest, um, now we come to know that actually the legal obligations for this particular region were based on several other things rather than just providing justice. And that was basically to restrain the incursion into this particular zone. So in 1901, uh, and this is an important aspect to understand for what I would actually relate to in the later part, that in 1901 they imposed a legal system in this particular region that's known as the FCR, it's known as the Frontier Crimes Regulation. Whereas modern law and the constitution of the rest of the country does not imply to this particular region. So it's something that, and to date, till 2014, which makes it an approximately 113 years, the legal system in this particular area has not been altered. There have been minor uh, recommendations, there have been minor changes, amendments, as we would refer to them, but nothing as usual. The legal system still remains the same as it was in 1901. Uh, initially, it was neither a part of Afghanistan and neither it was part of the British uh, India. It was considered to be a buffer zone which came into existence because of an agreement which is known as the Gandamak Agreement. I won't go into too many details, but just that it still remains that contentious part between two countries. And after independence, it, they decided, the tribal elders, they decided to become part of Pakistan. 
And the line that segregates this particular region is known as the Durand line, which is named after Henry Mortimer Durand was the person who actually segregated these two countries. And it's pretty arbitrary. I mean, if you actually go into this particular area, it's almost like 2,700 kilometers. And it's so arbitrary that once you actually travel to this area, at one point you are in Afghanistan and at another point when you take the next step you are actually in Pakistan. So it's not like some a defined kind of a border which you can actually understand. I remember going back to my village because since many people have migrated down from this part of the world towards the settled area, more urbanized districts. And I remember going back to my area in 1994 to my village which is right on the border of Afghanistan. And when I actually went there, we could not decide where the international border was because they just had an oil can set right in the middle of the mountain saying that that side was Pakistan and this side was Afghanistan. So it was actually, and it's to date, they've actually tried to cover this area, but it's impossible to actually cover 2,600 kilometers. Neither does uh, the military of the both sides have the capacity to actually p uh, p deploy troops in this area and neither is fencing a possibility. And as I told you, just to give you an overview of actually the area that is there, there are seven tribal quasi-districts. They are not considered to be like proper districts as such, but these are like units uh, where a certain kind of a legal system and administrative level system is put up. And then to segregate these tribal areas from the uh, urbanized Pakistan, there is something that is known as the FR, which are known as the frontier regions. And just, just to give you a basic understanding of actually how many divisions of progress, development, sociological structures in this uh, remain still in this particular area since 1901. And that's why it's impossible to understand the conflict that's going on in one particular go and the way that surveillance tactics by the states are imposed in order to control because since it's not like completely defined, you will not be able to understand it till you actually know the geographical depth of this particular region. And the frontier regions are those that actually segregate the tribal areas from the settled areas. These are known as buffer zones. The rules of the Pakistan's parliament, no matter whatever sort of rules they are, they do not apply to this particular area and the legal system as well as the peace maintenance system and uh, to sort of give some sort of security to its residents. Uh, there is a tribal council that actually decides several things over here. Uh, it's not that mainstream uh, laws apply over here. That is why nobody can be convicted. There are no courts over here. And usually it's the tribal council that decides the fate of certain people based on certain facts. Uh, what was what the current situation that you uh, look into the tribal areas, the way that it is shaped right now, and the way that it has had global impact, is because of certain happenings that had taken place over here in the last 30 to 40 odd years. And if you look at this slide, I mean, it's just in the 1988 you see the Soviet Union into that particular region and there's a war that's going on and then in 1991 the war ends. I won't go into too many details. And then there's an elected government in Afghanistan and the ruler was hanged in the UN compound by the militants. And then from 1992 till 1996 you see the Taliban rule in that area. And then you see Osama bin Laden shifting from Sudan to Kabul in 1996. And then uh, September 9-11 and uh, then you see the Americans in Afghanistan. And it's actually then when the trouble starts on both sides. Before that, it was troublesome, but it was not the way that it is it was disengaged. What has happened now is that when so many international forces have actually jumped into action, it's difficult to make out now what's happening in that particular area. Everybody has their own interests, and somehow the problem of militancy in this particular region has not been able to die down. Uh, this is a picture that was taken, I mean, in 2007 and 8, And that's what actually is the state of affairs back in Pakistan's border areas. Um, the problems are multi-pronged, and I will just skim through this before I actually get back to the um, part of surveillance and the way that internet connectivity and uh, many other things that are related to it. There's a counterinsurgency. There are more. There are more than 200 military operations that have been launched in that particular small area, um, and they are still continuing 
with the recent attacks that have taken place in Pakistan where more than 142 children were killed, um, I mean, that's given it more prominence and there's a full-fledged war that's going on in these areas. The conflict itself, since it's lasted more than three decades, has actually lasted till quite an extent and it's had tremendous amount of uh, impact on the sociological structures of the area. Uh, language has been impacted, even the behavior of the people has been impacted. We've seen large number of displacement trends taking place. The government and the international forces are now trying to put the parts together to actually redo of what was done over here, the kind of social engineering that has taken place. But for that, what they're trying to do is to actually now construct certain units which do not only deal with counterinsurgency, but something that is beyond and would ensure some kind of peace. Uh, the major problem is not the militants themselves because they only comprise of 2% of the total population. The major problem still remains the ideology that was infused in this area. Um, this is just a brief kind of an example to show that actually what's happening. And uh, three decades of social engineering has actually caused something that we have come to know as the clash and cove culture. And I was involved in some sort of research a couple of years back and we found out that a Klashenkov, which was basically a Russian-made weapon uh, that went into this area, uh, actually had 41 different names in different dialects. Uh, that's the kind of engineering that has taken place. Um, there's a big problem of sectarian differences, sectarian violence arising, and particularly uh, that's a worrisome point for the local authorities and the government and the people itself with the emergence of the ISIS in Iraq, in Syria, and possibly influence in these particular regions. Um, as far as the displacement trend is concerned, Pakistan is home to one of the largest population of displaced people that are internally displaced. And currently, the number is 2.2 million, but it's actually more than that. It's like somewhat 6.2 million. Uh, these are only the registered numbers. Um, one of the major problem that some sort of progress has not been possible so far has been a de destabilizing war economy uh, where some people have managed to make a lot of money, others still remain poor, and that's because of warring economy. An example of it is that uh, before the bombardment was taking place in one of these areas, and I remember as a journalist going down over there to actually ga gather the sentiments of actually what people were thinking over there, and there's one of these barren terrains where two brothers were fighting on a property dispute. And there was a council that was deciding, and it was just a few hours since the operation was going to begin. And somebody asked them that actually, what are you guys fighting about? This place is going to be bombarded into hell. And one of them replied that whatever sort of scrap material would be left back from the war would actually be sold and I would be a millionaire after that. You know? So that's the kind of mentality that has developed in this particular region. Uh, the people in the area, I mean, they demand peace, but peace is something that is uh, not happening so far. With the situation on ground, it's an impossibility to actually even think of it so far. Uh, there's so many stakeholders involved, so many issues that are involved. But this was just to give you a brief sort of a description of actually uh, what was going on and what tribal areas and what uh, Pakistan's problem of militancy stands for. Um, getting back to the point of... Um, I mean, I'm sorry, I've run out of slides. I'll speak for them. Yeah. Uh, getting back to the point of actually what happens around over here in terms of communication, you need to understand that a majority, a major part of the Snowden leaks actually deals with whatever was happening in this small little region. You know, we've come to know actually the kind of surveillance. Before that, it was actually not thought that the kind of surveillance that was taking place in this area. Uh, the internet over here is limited because there's hardly any infrastructure to transfer some sort of communication uh, to any sort of. There's hardly any telephone lines over here, and people mostly rely on data services provided by either cellular phones or either satellite phones, which puts them at a vulnerable risk at many levels because it's not just the state that is present over here. They are non-state actors, and journalism in this particular region is particularly very, very difficult because it's very difficult to get into this area and disseminate information. Usually the way that journalists work is that they go in there, they do not sort of reveal their identity, get out and get information, and get out of this particular zone. So the way that, I mean, there ha there's hardly any legal system where you can sort of 
go against or any sort of uh, you know legal uh, litigation where you can say that the state is you know against us because there is no state in this particular area there is no legal system where you can complain about and that is why surveillance is easy uh, but it actually puts not only the life of the people living over there at risk from the state but also from the non state actors and this was just to sort of like give you a brief sort of a background to this if i have any sort of questions i'm running out of time actually over here uh, there are so many things that I would want to talk about and maybe at a later point, but if there's any sort of questions from what I've actually discussed, you're more than welcome to ask me right now. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you, Iftikha. Yeah. Is there any question, comment? Yes, stay in the back. There, thank you, um, Jillian. Uh, thank you for that. And you mentioned the the leaks, uh, the Edward Snowden leaks. And I'm just curious, have they hurt, helped, or and does the current withholding of more leaks on this region of the world harm further or help? In terms of the information that is given out and what the leaks actually show us, that there was a massive level of surveillance, almost thirteen thousand five hundred files, from what I actually can recall, maybe more than that. Uh, second, after Iran, it was Pakistan that actually was surveyed the most. Uh, from what we know from the leaks itself is that um, some of the drone strikes, the drone campaign uh, that was taking place in this area was part, uh, partly based on those leaks. So if you are pro-drone, then you think that actually they were helpful. And if you are anti-drone, then you actually think because drones themselves are something that we have come to term as a free floating signifier whose importance, which importance is actually based on the way that your own thinking is tilted towards. Civilian casualties have taken place, obviously. I mean, I think otherwise. I hope I an answered your question in some extent. Okay. Answered? Question answered? All right, great. There's another question over here. Hi, um, a friend of mine who went to Pakistan recently uh, told me that um, people actually have problem, uh, have trust issues about uh, cell phones because uh, they think cell phones can uh, attract drones to attack them in a way. So cell phones in the same time can like take surveys, for example, something like that to, for development. So I want to hear more about like what is the general like um, yeah, yeah, I get like what I, how, uh, how people perceive uh, modern technology. Do they think it's like something fearful or something like perspective? Technology is usually uh, one of the reasons that xenophobia prevails over here. And it's an interesting thing to know that actually in this particular zone, the militant groups that are functional, they don't allow you to use Android phones. Um, one is because of the reason that you pointed out that they attract the signals do attract some kind of, you know, uh, surveillance uh, and drones. And usually from uh, a large number of people have been killed by militant organizations uh, for spying because they do think that cellular phones and the ch SIM cards are actually used to track down whatever they are doing in that particular area. So, yeah, in this region, cell phones are considered to be banned and there have been massive campaigns being held where people have been told to discard the cell phones and the phones have been publicly burned. But this is a very smaller area. In urbanized Pakistan, the problem does not exist. Yeah. Right. Yes. Hi. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the ideology of the population? Is it um, political? Is it seeking autonomy? Is it um, reactionary? Could you describe it? I think partly all of them that you mentioned. It depends upon from time to time what's happening. If you want to think about what's happening right now after more than 142 kids were killed in the school, I think the re it's been more of a reactionary thing rather than anything else, you know? The people are angry of actually why isn't the counterinsurgency working the way that it should be, and that's why they've given out a public reaction. There have been massive protests. The country's been closed down, and just for the sake of it, I mean, uh, death penalty, which was banned for the last couple of years, 
has been sort of legalized once again. It's been reopened. People are being hanged. The militants that were there are being hanged. Um, but in terms of the general populace, it's a pretty democratic country. And slowly and gradually, uh, people that were silent, uh, they are coming down to the streets. They want some sort of transparency of whatever has been happening over here. It was something that was not present there previously, the way that people thought, but now people are getting more and more aware about global trends in terms of freedom, transparency, legal rights, and legal issues. So it's still building up. I wouldn't say like 100%, but somewhere like around about 40 to 60% ratio, people are still like coming into the global trends to, to realize um, of what uh, human rights in general are. And this area that I've mentioned, I mean, there's no such thing as human rights. Since you don't have any courts, any legal system, there's no such thing as human rights that are recognized. And there's a full-fledged movement that, uh, by the people themselves that is there in Pakistan which demands that human rights be extended to this part of the world. Any minutes? Any more questions? Well, I would have one. Um, how many people do live in these areas you talked about, like the border area? Yeah, that's border an zone. yeah, that's an important question actually, because of the situation and the conflict. It's even difficult for the government to give you an estimated population because they haven't been able to conduct a survey or, or a census over here since 1998. So the last survey tells you that a pop an estimated population of around about 3.4 to 4.2 million was living over here. But recently we've come to know that actually it's like more than 8.5 million people that are residing in this area. But these are not figures that are officially uh, given out because of the conflict. The government's apparatus is not functional and you cannot carry out a census. Yeah. There's two more questions over here. Yeah, I was just wondering about the human impact of the drone strikes because it's all very abstract and I think part of the appeal of it for, for those who are conducting drone attacks is they are so abstract. There's a robot kills terrorist narrative and it, it kind of works. So in those specific areas, what, what, what is the impact? How, how does it affect people's lives? How, I mean, if you were in one of those villages, how, how many people would you know who, who have been attacked or, or you know... There are actually a large number of people that have actually been attacked in this area and there have been civilian casualties but usually they are put under the carpet. They are not being reported in many ways and just one of the reasons for that is that media access into this area is limited. Uh, you are not allowed to go and there is hardly, it is sort of an informational black hole that I would term. It is difficult to get out information in this zone. As far as uh, militants being killed and the UN's reaction and the international reaction to drone strikes, I think uh, a major chunk of the drone um, program in this area has actually been closed down. They are pretty limited drone strikes, but in the times when the drones were hovering over here and the strikes that have taken place, they have killed terrorists. Um, that's a fact, but they have on the price for collateral damage and they have civilian casualties that have taken place. Um, we hear about the term tribal area a lot, and I always accepted it uh, as yeah, just the name of the area. But what, uh, um, in terms of social structure, what makes this area tribal? The term tribe has come to be associated with a derogatory term now. You know, yeah. Um, there's a movement that wants that either it should be granted an autonomous status, and it should be its name should be changed. The way that it's been defined, it was called tribal areas by the British when they were ruling that region. And then in the Pakistani constitution post-independence, it was known as special areas. Then later on in 1972, they called them Kata, which was centrally administered tribal areas. And now they call them Fata, which is federally administered tribal areas. You know. So there's not much of a difference with the name, but individually these uh, districts, they do have a name. And slowly and gradually, as I answered him, people are realizing over here because war is a very strange phenomena. It actually has negative points attached to it and it does, has its own pos it does have its own positivities um, in many ways. Uh, most of these people had not left their area before the conflict began. And I'll give you an example. I was teaching at the university. 
and these these electronic doors in you know which you have at every store over here that would open up themselves automatically and close down and so one of the students who was enrolled in the university uh, we went to have coffee at one of these uh, cafes and he, i suddenly lost him you know and i went back to find him and he was actually standing there looking at the door thinking that it was some kind of magic that was taking place it just shows you the level of uh, the kind of ignorance that these people have been forced to oh it's not out of choice it's something that is imposed uh, what the need of the art is more transparency and that would probably bring mm, a better name in that context yeah one last question in the back here oh uh, hi um i was wondering you mentioned inside the area there's a bit of a media black hole and journalists go in um and then come straight out and tell the world what's going on but i wondered how do the people inside that area get information between themselves and also what kinds of basic services do they have access to yeah. like education yeah that's an important question and thank you it was on one of my agendas but i don't know i lost the slide so i'm sorry i couldn't answer that but now i'll answer it um 80% of the population it relies upon radio by the way 80% of the population they still use radio and then internally tribal tribes have set up some kind some kind of an intercom facility for themselves which is not a very extensive kind of a networking thing in some areas cell phones are allowed but those are only very limited um in terms of and the way that you collect news is an interesting phenomena because since this area is mostly closed down you don't have access to many areas that you would want to go to as journalists so one of the most interesting part to collect news and the way that tribals communicate with each other is that they actually all sort of have put up uh, chairs on bus stops because everybody would eventually had to come to a bus stop and that's how they communicate and that's how information is exchanged so that's one of the ways but yeah in some places internet is made available but that internet is terrible don't ask about that that's a very different story of the way that that internet works it's mostly satellite connected and state monitored so they and uh, journalism and the way that journalists uh, communicate from that particular area they actually have to in some places show the state of what they publishing and after it's approved it actually goes through yeah yeah last last question uh hi i just want to know could you talk a little bit about um what sort of activist networks exist there because you're saying people want transparency and i mean and you have talked about journalism i i know that there's a strong movement of journalists and lawyers in pakistan but i'm wondering if uh what other kinds of activist networks exist they are activists were present in this area but then what happened was that activists started getting targeted and in the last 4 to 5 years it's been terrible because women activists women rights activists um human rights activists a large number of them have been targeted a somewhat uh, estimated number would be in the last 5 to 6 years more than 130 that have been actually killed in this area uh, activists the the main way that activism now functions from here is that it's they it mostly relies on the educated class those that have somehow managed to leave this area live in urbanized areas they run usually campaigns um for this region so that more transparency could come back but foreign ngos and even local ngos uh, are not allowed to work here by the state itself uh, one is the security issues that are related to this particular region and the number of deaths that have taken place and secondly there is a lot of Uh, i mean the way that this region is always in focus and somehow in in a history that pakistan has managed to create in other ways is the perception that most of the international um non governmental organizations are in are usually like working for espionage and one of the cases uh, where a health campaign was used to trace obl or some in london has actually even further buried that idea so it's very difficult to activists for activists to actually function yeah all right thank you iftiha for this uh, very interesting insight
a rather different side of what one could call net politics or digital, pol digital politics, I would say. Um, I guess you'll be around uh, for a little while, so if there are any more further questions or, uh, yeah, if there's any need to discuss. And yeah. actually, we are at the end of our net political evening already. Uh, I'll switch to German again. Sure. Genau, das ist schon das Ende. Äh, zwei kurze Vorträge, ähm, die sehr unterschiedliche Seiten des Netzlebens von Netzpolitik, von Digitalpolitik heute Abend beleuchtet haben. Auch Alex wird noch weiter hier sein und ansprechbar sein, Iftikha auch. Ähm, vielen Dank für euren Input. Vielen Dank an die Redner. Thank you, Iftikha. Vielen Dank, Alex, again. Und... Ähm, Vielen Dank an die Seabase, die wie immer hier den Livestream bereitgestellt hat und die Räume bereitgestellt hat und äh, uns hier Raum gegeben hat. Der nächste netzpolitische Abend findet statt am 3. Februar, immer der erste Dienstag im Monat. Wenn ihr selber mal hier vorne stehen wollt und uns Dinge erzählen wollt, Dinge, die interessant sind, dann sprecht uns einfach an, auch wenn ihr sonst weitere Fragen habt. Ich habe, glaube ich, den gesamten Vorstand der DigiGest zum Beispiel hier gesehen. Sing, winkt doch mal eben, singen könnt ihr auch, aber winken. Also die stehen hier auch überall rum. Alex ist noch da, Eftira ist noch rum. Wenn ihr noch Fragen habt oder Diskussionsbedarf, schießt los. Ansonsten ja, Prost und noch einen geselligen Abend.